My wife and I are outdoor enthusiasts. We follow a lot of other couples on Instagram in hopes of finding new spots to camp at, or to hike, or just generally have a fun experience. Remember that time we went sand surfing in Morocco as one of the most interesting experiences we had had. But this year, we wanted to try something different and a little scary, so we decided to go for a full week of disconnect. No cell phones, because the place where we were going to camp at had no reception anyway, and no technology whatsoever. We'd have everything we needed packed in our backpacks, a gun to protect ourselves in case of an animal attack, and enough food to last for a week. This was an ambitious project, but we were confident we could do it. The place we chose for that expedition was in Vermont. There was a campsite not too far from us. But our goal was not the campsite, but to go deep into the mountains to see if we could, you know, survive a week without technology or anything. Now, we weren't suicidal, so we made sure to bring enough biodegradable tape markings to avoid getting lost. Our starting point was the campsite at the base of the mountain. We didn't plan on following a trail or anything. As they say, we were going off the beaten track. And hell, it was exciting. My wife and I couldn't wait to drop off the kids at her sister and just go on an adventure. Since the kids... Oh yeah, we had twins. Anyway, since they were born a year ago, we didn't have much time to ourselves or... Well, we haven't done anything fun in a while. Now, my wife worked out really hard to get back in shape so that we could do something like this. Frankly, I couldn't have asked for a better partner in crime and mother to my children. But let's not get sappy about how great my wife is. And let's just talk about this famous risky camping trip. We dropped the twins off at Kayla's sister's place and drove off four hours to go to Vermont. We had a nice dinner and spent the first night of our week in a cheap roadside motel because it was too late to get to the campsite and make camp. It'd be dark before we even found a nice camping spot. I put my alarm on my cell phone to wake up early the next morning. I knew it would be the last use I'd have of my phone for the rest of the week. After drinking a bottle of wine and spending what was left of our energy, we fell asleep, ready for our adventure to start the next day. I woke up about 15 minutes before the alarm went off. Now, I've always hated the sound of alarms, so as far as I can remember, I've always woken up before they went off. I turned off my phone completely and went to make a cheap cup of coffee in the coffee maker we had in our room. Kayla woke up to the sound of hot water bubbling and coffee starting to drip. After a quick shower and breakfast, Kayla and I packed our dirty clothes and we drove off to the campsite. And we had no intention of camping here, but we were leaving our names somewhere, at least, in case anything happened. Not that we thought anything would happen, we were just going to explore the wild a little, and had enough tape to mark the entire forest two times. It was more of a precautionary measure than anything. Once we paid for a week of the campsite, we parked our car at our designated spot and made a beeline for the forest. We had no real starting point or end goal. We just wanted to try something risky and adventurous for a week. And so, off we went into the forest with our backpacks. The sun was on our side for the first day, and the shade provided by the foliage was more than enough to keep us protected. We walked and talked for hours before finally stopping for a quick lunch break. I got my camping pots out and we prepared a quick instant oatmeal. With it, we ate dehydrated fruits, salami, and a slice of aged cheddar. Now, call us fancy, but being in the woods for a week didn't mean I would survive on granola bars and peanut butter. Though we brought both, meat and cheese just sounded really good that day. Once we were full, we cleaned up the place, made sure the fire was correctly extinguished by throwing dirt and water on it. And that's when I saw the shadow for the first time. Between the trees, maybe 30, 40 feet from where we were standing. I thought the vapor and smoke were fucking with my vision, so I called out to Kayla and pointed toward the form. She squinted, then asked me what she was looking at. 
but I couldn't answer her, and when I tried to take a step forward, it disappeared. Disgruntled, I turned my focus back on the ashes and drowned them until I didn't hear a sizzling noise anymore and until all the smoke had cleared. I checked around the general area where I saw the shadowy thing and I couldn't find a trace of it. I didn't push it further because, you know, after all, it could have been the smoke tricking me. I mean, who knows? With that in mind, Kayla and I went further into the forest and found a very small pond. It wasn't very clean or deep, so there wasn't anything to be excited about. But we found a small clearing not too far, which would be perfect for our first night in the forest. We built our tent, shoved our backpacks in the tent, and it was about time to prepare some more food. And then a little later on, as the sun started to set, we went down to lie in our tent. And that's when we saw it again. And by seeing, I mean, experienced it. There was some sort of quiet howling outside, which we first mistook for the wind. Then what looked like fingers pressing against the side of our tent. And we saw it clear as day. And Kayla screamed as the shadow's face pushed against the wall of our tent. We could see a nose, a chin, and a forehead. Between Kayla's pleas to do something and that thing pushing against our tent, I had no choice. I grabbed my gun, unzipped the door, and got out as fast as I could, ready to shoot the shit out of whoever was messing with us. But when I got outside and around the tent corner, there was nothing. And with my flashlight in hand, I quickly scanned around until I saw it again, at the edge of the clearing. Something hiding behind a tree. When the light hit it, it moved to the other side of the tree, as if trying to avoid being flashed directly by the light. I could even make out the shadow's form, and it resembled that of a human with blurry edges. But I couldn't see its face. Just like in the day, all I saw was a dark mass. And at that point, I flashed my flashlight at it, and it disappeared completely. And for about five minutes straight, I looked around, my knees trembling slightly. What the hell was that? I remember thinking, and it's only when Kayla called me back into the tent that I gave up my search and returned inside. Now, I didn't tell her about the shadow again, because again, <laughs> hell, I wasn't sure of what I actually saw. I told her I saw something between the branches, and it could have been someone trying to prank us, but I lost track of it. And then that night, well, it took us forever to fall asleep, but we eventually did. Not even the wind was making a sound, and all I could hear was the sound of crickets and various bugs near the tent. When I woke up, the morning dew was still clinging to the grass, and I could feel it as I went to the edge of the woods looking for branches or anything to burn. But it wasn't by chance that I was roaming in the same place I'd last seen the shadow. I wanted to find proof of its existence. But at the same time, I didn't. I mean, it's not that I'm a coward or anything, but you don't really want to be followed by anything when you're deep into the woods. Plus, we didn't go half as far as we wanted to. And I didn't want Kayla to worry too much. I mean, we've been waiting for this trip for a long time, and I wasn't going to let a trick of the eye ruin it for us. Now, maybe I had almost convinced myself that we were being pranked by a guy who had too much time on his hands. Who knows? I mean, I certainly didn't. But my gun was still right at my hip if the guy tried anything else. I went back to the camp, prepared a fire, and started some coffee for when my wife would wake up. I also prepared some instant oatmeal and a small platter of cheese and dehydrated fruits, and a piece of salami for her. Once we woke up, we ate and packed our stuff, and then decided to go a little further. We were only on day two of our trip, so we could afford another day or so of getting deep into the forest. We made sure to extinguish the fire again, mark our way with tape, and started walking to go deeper into the forest. 
But I felt like I was being watched, observed even. From the corner of my eyes, I almost always saw something dark and blurry. Not enough to say that I full on saw it though, just enough to say there's something. Never enough to make out what it is. Now it's the same feeling you get when you're a child and your closet door is open. There's the sleeve of your bathrobe hanging out, but in your terrified little mind, it's a monster and it's out to get you. So you close your eyes, roll under your blanket, and wait a few seconds before looking again. You look again and squint, and soon realize it's just an inoffensive piece of clothing. But you still feel something dark and gritty about that open closet, so you run to it to close the door so that you could sleep better. Except that I'm not sleeping. I'm very much awake, and there is no door to close. Only the sinking feeling that something is wrong. Or, something is going to go wrong. And then I heard a crack and a thump. About five meters on our left, a large tree branch suddenly cracked and fell. We both jumped in surprise and gasped. And I realized at this moment that Kayla looks just as tense as I do. Are you okay? I ask her, and she turns toward me, her face pale and eyes wide. She looks just like a deer in the headlights. A very sick deer, may I add. Her bottom lip trembles and she seems a bit hesitant, so I encourage her quietly. And that's when she admits she feels as if we're being followed. Now I thought it was only me. I ask her about the shadow. And she confirms that she has no idea what it is, but she can also see it. It's always there, nagging her from the corner of her vision. And she says she noticed one thing. It's always on our left. Now, I didn't pay attention to that, but she's right. Whenever I saw it on my right, something dragged my attention to the left, like the branch falling, for example. Thinking about the branch, I decided to go check it out, and Kayla follows behind me. Much to my surprise, this branch isn't rotten or dead. It doesn't even look like it cracked, but rather it was cut perfectly. And there isn't anyone else around other than us, or whatever it is that's following us. And then, again, about 50 meters away, another branch falls. It's right in front of us, but further than the first branch. If the first branch was to get our attention, the second is to guide us. At least, that's what I think. My hand hovers over my gun as I see the shadow in the distance, close to where I assume the branch fell. I ask Kayla if she sees this too. She confirms quietly with a nod. The shadow form is still hiding behind a tree, but... Hell, I could tell it was human. I could tell because of the head shape and the limbs. No matter how blurry they are. I have 20-20 vision. I've never had any problems with my eyes in my life. But I can't make out its face or anything else. If it were a human 50 meters away, I would be able to tell their hair color. At least, this is a humanoid shaped shadow. And I don't feel threatened. So I decided to move forward and follow it. Whatever it is that's trying to get our attention. We'll get a bullet if I think it's anything going awry. Kayla follows behind me, eyes locked on the shadow. I could hear the sound of the stream and the smell of wet soil. We were getting closer to a water source. But there's another scent in the air. And I can't say that it's a pleasant one. The shadow keeps disappearing and reappearing, always half hiding behind a tree. It almost looks shy, but my heart is still in my throat, and its beat just won't slow down. I can't take the pressure, so I pull my gun out, feeling like we're about to make a discovery or something. And I feel Kayla's hand on my shoulder and start walking slower as the sound of the stream gets louder and the stench 
become stronger. Now I haven't reached yet that I already know what I'm about to find. You see, the sound of thousands of flies gives it away. I can't find the branch that fell this time, but I finally saw what the shadow led us to. Kayla looks once and while well, she nearly fainted, I can hear the oatmeal coming out at full force from her stomach. Lying on the ground is the body of a woman. There's a gaping hole under her left breast, which reveals a ribcage in her innards. Flies are buzzing about, but there are also signs that she's been nibbled at by forest animals. There's a finger missing, a slash on her throat, and half of her body is submerged in water. And that part was swollen and blue in a way I didn't think was humanly possible. And the smell was intense. But I couldn't keep my eyes off of hers. I never knew looking into someone's dead eyes could be so terrifying. We hiked all the way back to the campsite in double time, marking the way with our tape. When we got back to the car, we called the local sheriff's office. Hell, they were there within 15 minutes. Dogs, cops, you name it, they were there. The woman's name was Claudia Infante, a local waitress gone missing that was suspected as running away from her abusive partner. After that, I didn't follow the rest of the news articles or the videos or anything else when it came out. It was just all too real. And you know... I never believed in spirits up until that point. I guess you never know what you will find in the woods, or what will find you.